What's that look for? It's bad when your own face scares you. <laughs> it, it was very red for a minute. <laughs> well, I thought it was because I clicked on at the same time and you saw my face. You're like, oh, good. <laughs> How uh, things at the Institute, Dave? Thank goodness it's Friday. <laughs> right? Every day's a holiday. Good. Every meal's a feast. You sound Thanks optimistic, David. Big football game on Saturday. Who is it? Citadel. Yeah. Some school in the in South Carolina. I'm not sure. What's the uh, expectation? Are they bringing their core or anything like that? Um, I don't believe we're able to have that capacity. Uh, it's a sellout. I, I, I don't know for a fact, but I think they're bringing some of their, their kids, but not, not the core. Gotcha. Just, just, it'd be crazy to try to pack a ton of kids in buses and all that kind of mm. stuff. And, and I don't think we're allowed to have that many people in Foster Stadium. Okay, I don't recall the last time I saw you clean shaven. I wasn't sure who you were there for a minute. Who? Looking good. Who? Oh, ah. oh Chuck. Yeah, Chuck. It's a brand it's oh my you. gosh, I didn't recognize him. <laughs> <laughs> Lost 15 years. <laughs> I'll, go I'll go 10. Back in the 30s again. Way to go, Chuck. Hello, Mr. Alligan. Hello. I've got the appointed hour of six o'clock, so we'll uh, kick off. I will uh, thank you all for sacrificing uh, one of the most beautiful days of April that we're uh, on Zoom instead of uh, perhaps uh, in a, a yard somewhere discussing these matters and uh, hope we can continue to, to uh, work towards meeting in person. For tonight's purposes, um, I anticipate an intro from uh, Jim and any words from Jake and then uh, council members asking questions. I would ask that uh, as you present your questions, if you can identify the page and number of the budget uh, or in the CIP so we can uh, read along with you. Sometimes it's uh, hard to keep up, especially when we're uh, remote as we are. But are there any other expectations for our time this evening? Fair enough. Uh, Jim, I'll let you get started. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We're going to keep it short. Uh, Jeff is here with us as well as uh, Jake and myself. Jake is just going to go through a very brief overview. You did anticipate my point as well of uh, using page numbers and maybe taking a little pause so we can all catch up since we're in this, uh, this version of our conversation. We don't have the visual cues that we have around the table typically. So Jake, you want to take it? Sure. Uh, thanks, Jim. Well, good, good evening, everyone. Um, just to kind of recap a little bit from uh, our last meeting with the budget public hearing. Um, so again, we're, we're projecting a really good uh, kind of bounce back year from COVID. Um, you know, things just weren't quite as bad as we anticipated, thankfully. So um, we see some light at the end of the tunnel and we're happy to reflect that in the, in the budget packet. Um, so just to summarize our, our general fund, we're anticipating revenues of about 18.4 million. Um, that's about 1.3 more than we ultimately budgeted for FY21. And if you recall, we cut a little over 2 million out of the budget, uh, out of the proposed FY21 budget before adoption. So we're projecting some growth. We're heading back in the right direction, but you know, we anticipate this will be a multi-year process of getting back to, to pre-COVID levels. And uh, you know we want to be conservative with that this year and anticipate a big step forward, but not quite all the way back in one year. Um, that's against expenses of about 13.4 million in the general fund and interfund transfers of about 4.8 million. Um, there are no tax uh, increases reflected in this proposed budget. No no tax increases of any type. Um, in the utility fund, uh, we do uh, propose 8% uh, um, uh, increase in the water sewer rate, and that's largely due to um, wholesale increases from the Maury Service Authority as we continue to see those each year. And additionally, um, 
uh, an amount to cover our 3% margin that we need for ongoing capital projects. Um, as you'll note in the utility fund budget, there's um, just shy of $7 million in capital outlay. And the largest portion of that is gonna be the diamond area um, water sewer project which, that we uh, anticipate beginning in early FY22, um, as well as the design phase work for Jackson area water sewer and um, additional I, &I remediation efforts. Um, for equipment replacement and our equipment replacement fund, we anticipate restoring full funding to that from the general fund this year, uh, about $630,000 of equipment replacement contributions against 577,000 in proposed equipment purchases. And for our CIP, uh, we have about 1.26 million in proposed capital projects. This is a huge change from last year where we cut nearly everything out of the CIP for FY21. So we're very pleased to be able to get projects back on the schedule for FY22, especially a lot of paving. Uh, Jeff worked out a really good proposed paving um, uh, task list for FY22 that we're excited to be able to take on. Um, we are in a kind of a creative way of funding these projects this, this year um, as revenues will continue to improve over the next year or two. Um, we're proposing $530,000 of contributions from the general fund in order to finance these projects. We'll have uh, from, from contributions made in FY21, uh, at least 600,000 in excess contributions made this year to go towards capital projects for next year. Um, again, we kept the contributions going in, but projects were cut down to an absolute minimum this year. So we'll have excess funding there. And Jim and I look forward uh, to, to bringing down the road, maybe in May, a proposal to take some of our um, anticipated year-end carryover that we'll still have, a pretty, pretty healthy balance remaining, and put some of that towards capital and equipment as well. Um, I think it would be a very wise use of those funds. Um, so all in all, I think we've got a very positive buzz, a budget picture here for you. Um, proposing a surplus, showing a surplus in the general fund of a little over $250,000. And again, with no tax increases, um, just, just anticipating revenue increases and working very diligently with our staff to come up with the best um, expense proposal that we can to, to wisely and conservatively use available funds. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to if there are any questions. Um, we did update the CIP and added the Floyd SK renovation project from the high school. It was a one addition to the CIP. Um, there's a $4.6 million project and our cost share of that is roughly $735,000. So that's been added to the CIP and this is for FY23. This is a FY23 proposed project um, you know, ultimately, we don't know if that will go through or not on the county end, but we, we need to prepare and um, you know, financially plan as if it will. Um, so with that, I would be happy to take any input or thoughts or uh, questions that council may have on the proposed budget as, as presented. Jake, just to uh, clarify real quick, um, on the, the second page, fiscal year 23, you're talking about the high school piece, I see uh, to consider 552,000. Uh, that this, the, so this is an added piece to the CIP. It, I don't believe it's in the, the budget packet that you had last week. So I've shared my screen. If everyone can see, okay. um, this is their, our CIP updated, uh, just revised this as of today's date. Um, so I've put in the Floyd SK renovation here and we'll get this updated CIP up on the website and out to you if, if you don't have it, but um, this is the one, one added project here that I've highlighted for you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Just looking to uh, keep, keep track of all the funding opportunities. And is it fair to say that um, the, the county will likely finance that and just hand us some debt service? That, that would be that would be my assumption that for a project of that size they'll do a bond issue or something equivalent and you know we'll we'll pay our um, anticipated share of that debt service so the, the 752 is scheduled but likely will end up being substantially less that needs to be funded that year yes yes if that's ultimately the route they go then it would, would be financed over you know a number of years so a much smaller uh, 
you know, piece over year over year instead of one large lump sum, but we'll, we'll see how they attempt to handle that project and finance it. Thank you, sir. Can I ask a question while we're talking about that portion of the budget out into the future? On page 91 or, or so, um, there's a reference to the city's portion of the HVAC energy reduction project that we participated in that we had presentations on back in June 2017. And at that time, uh, the high school, the, the county school signed on to, I think, several million dollars worth of energy reduction uh, projects at the high school and at their other uh, buildings. When you just get any details about that, um, can you touch base with them and ask them if modifications to the Floyd S. K. Votex Center will make all of the projections null and void. Um, that was something that we all brought up because they've got projections going out 15, 20 years for the millions of dollars that we will save on energy. And the questions were, well, as soon as we remodel one inch of the high school or the Votex building, will all of those projections, if you will, that, that look very pros you know, promising, are they null and void? You know, they, so just could you touch base, and maybe ask that question. Uh, there's still gonna be energy savings, but you know, the guarantee might not be there when you, when you change things. That, that's a great point. I'll be sure to bring that up with, uh, with school staff and see if we can get an answer for you. I have a question about the 750 for the Floyd SK. Uh, what typically uh, would be uh, our the city's debt service portion? I know it's in the 20% on capital stuff at the, and it's like 17% for operating stuff. Uh, uh, the, the percentage I've gotten that would be our cost share from the superintendent would be 17.1% of capital. Okay, 17. So I had, I was flip flopped on that. But in any event, the uh, getting back to the 750, that's our share initially. That's that's our projected net present value that's going to be financed, uh, and we'd be paying debt service for that. Uh, that would be figured in to the bill, I guess, that the city would receive from the county for the yes. project. That would be my presumption if they do decide to finance it. That the, that, right. that it would be would then come through our high school contribution, um, you know, ever however how long the, the debt service schedule is. Right, and to follow up with uh, David Ziegler's point about modifying the high school, uh, tending to negate uh, all these energy saving projects that were discussed and approved a while back. So that question. Uh, uh, David would also be mine uh, to get further information about. Uh, I'd be curious to know if somehow uh, any changes or modifying to the school would make, make all those savings go away and they turn into cost because they're now shifted over to the capital side of the school budget. So I, I would uh, second uh, David's point uh, about Ziegler's point about finding out just how those uh, potential savings, if any, uh, are going to work out for this budget. As I recall, they were substantial when they were initially discussed, which was the reason they were adopted. Mm -hmm. The energy savings were to, to pay for the uh, expenses associated with it. Mm -hmm. Just one clarification on our, our school share. Uh, it is always based for both capital and for operating based on our percentage of students. It was a higher amount when we initially built the school. It was somewhat, it was between 20 and 20, I think it was closer to 25%. But from here on out, it's based on our percentage, which has been running pretty consistently between 16 and 17%. That's correct. Yeah. Which is where the 17.1 comes from? That's correct. All right. Other questions? I'll ask um, one. On uh, the electoral board. One, Leslie. 
a part, <laughs> I'll ask a few, but uh, on, uh, so I guess on page um, num uh, Roman numeral six of our budget book, it, there's a comment that the registrar's budget's gonna increase by nearly $40,000. And looking at that is, uh, best I can tell, is, is most of that coming from the locality? It looks like we might be getting an additional 13,000 from the state, but the rest is coming from us. Yes, we, we will get some additional funding from the state, um, but the, a large portion of that will have to be funded through the locality. And that's in response to the new uh, 45 day um, in-person uh, voting before an election and the staffing that's involved in that and having officers of election here manning a, registra uh, a voting site and then as well as additional supplies and things of that nature that that, uh, that new state law has, has created. Okay, thank you. And just one comment on the, if you're going to give us uh, new pages to the CIP, if we can use a lighter shade of green, it would be <laughs> I can certainly tone the green down, no problem. Second. Everything looks good. <laughs> yeah, I agree, it's hard to read the green. Hard for me to read the green. I think the first draft we used, it was a very bright pink and I thought that was a little too much. So I'll, I'll tone it down even further. <laughs> I've got a few questions, so I'll, I don't know if you want them all at once. I'll let everyone else go, but I've got one uh, just that every, everyone probably is wondering about. What happened to the concept of the cigarette tax that was being discussed with Univista in Rockbridge County? So uh, Jim and I are still discussing that. We hope to bring something forth to council to consider um, and putting that into motion. Because this is a reassessment year, we've been working with uh, Karen, our commissioner, pretty heavily. We don't think we could get that into um, effect and enforced by any sooner than January 1. So, and again, in looking at the revenue potential from the cigarette tax, it's, you know, kind of a shot in the dark, really. I mean, we've looked at a lot of different similar localities and tried to come up with a decent projection. Um, ultimately, if we do bring something to council and, and, and ordinances adopted, um, we would anticipate, you know, just seeing what we would get for this year, not planning on using any of those funds in this budget, uh, just whenever it goes into effect, if it's January 1 or after whatever date, and just seeing what revenues we see over the course of maybe half a fiscal year uh, before we start programming using any of that revenue for any particular purpose and, and just see how that, you know, tax is going to implement itself in Lexington. And I, I, I bring that up just because I, I get concerned that the legislator will, since they considered it, um, enact a commission that takes control of cigarette taxes and want to have something in place that's collecting some sort of a tax when, mm -hmm. if that does occur, you know, that we're already in the, have that in place. So we're grandfathered. I, I had thought that had occurred already. But that was adopted because that's why Spencer and I were, were holding it. They adopted theirs, but, um, and I do tend to bring it to you just so it gets adopted on the books. But my understanding is we, we can't implement it until the commission decides how we are to implement that. Okay. All right. Thank so you. I think we have to have six communities or more to form a regional commission. And then we would uh, end up paying that commission a portion of our taxes in order to collect it for us and sell the, the coupons, et cetera. Okay, thanks, Jim. Thank you, okay. Sort of along those uh, same lines, has there been any discussion um, on Washington Street about an admissions tax similar to what uh, the county's done and, and where we could gain some revenues from that? I know WDL's, um, um, I don't think they charge much for events, but, uh, um, you know, football games, basketball games at VMI might be able to, that might be an opportunity. Well, Is frankly, that, oh, I'm sorry. I'm uh, David's frankly, shaking his head and I'm just curious why. Well, frankly, you know, with the economy being as soft as it is, some of those entities that we might end up charging for some admissions, um, some of them might be hurt a little bit. That didn't seem like a reasonable thing to do to me in this in this period of time anyway, with the economy being a little soft. Now I know VMI and WNL aren't affected, but there may be some other entities out there that could yeah, I feel that. I wasn't thinking about this year, I was thinking of the following year. Oh, my apologies. Yes, following year, absolutely like to pursue it. And I thought VMI's events 
we're exempt but I, from, from a local tax. Because I don't think we get meals tax off of their concessions, do we? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Jake, have you heard anything? I, I, I don't know for a fact. I mean, being that they are a state school and are, are likely tax exempt uh, in, in that fashion, I would imagine that's a correct assumption, but I, I don't know for sure. It, it, it wasn't every event, uh, talking about WNL events, it wasn't every event at WNL that uh, WNL charges for. Uh, there, there was a period of time, it may still be, where they made it free to the community, mm -hmm. uh, space available to be able to come and participate in WNL events. Is that still the case? So that, that's why I asked the question. I don't know what opportunities would be at WNL. I'm sure they'd be quite limited because they don't need to charge for events and, and, and rarely take the opportunity. I was focused more on uh, their neighbor at, uh, uh, at the Institute. I would tell you Washington Lee does not charge for their athletic events. They do for um, plays and uh, music ensembles. Some of the music uh, things are free. Uh, however, uh, postseason, the NCAA does require a ticketing. So when Washington Lee hosts uh, lacrosse, um, uh, uh, ODAC uh, tournament, there is a, uh, a ticket fee that's charged for those. Um, and if they progress and, and host other events, tennis, et cetera, there is a, a fee and we'd be able to do those. I, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, as special as BMI is, they're not more special than UVA or Virginia Tech, and I'm pretty certain that they charge uh, mission taxes for them. But I look forward to Jake's research and finding out what what it would look like to implement that. Um, because when you look at an admissions tax, you also got to think about places like um, uh, Stonewall Jackson House. I'm trying to think of any other museums within the city limits that would be subject to an admissions tax as well. Even the movie theater downtown, of course. Mm -hmm. Correct. A, a lot of things that kids attend that you end up making it more expensive and less accessible. Well, I remember when my son participated in swimming, uh, the parents were always nicked whenever you had to attend some some event where your your children were participating in, and that was largely who went to swimming events. Uh, so the parents got to pay twice, I guess you could say. I w I'd like to return uh, a question to the schools. There's been uh, mention made of summer session, and there's been mention made statewide of having year-round school. Uh, they haven't committed yet statewide to year-round school, but they have committed this summer to having school uh, for the summertime for kids, uh, students to be able to recover. I think that's the word that was used at the high school uh, in the county. Uh, uh, deficiencies from the first semester and maybe even from the second semester. And so I'd read where Lexington is going to offer summer school. So has that additional amount already been figured into our budget because we're going to have to pay our share too. Mr. Allegood, uh, if I may, Jake and I met with uh, Rebecca Walters and Tommy this afternoon to go over what they are to present to city council next week. There is a joint session, of course, of the school board and city council next week. Um, they will be paying for that. I believe uh, Jake wasn't it out of the, their share of the American rescue plan. Isn't that what they were doing? Plus the care, their third round of CARES funding. I think they were using a combination of those two funds. That, that's correct. The, the third round of CARES funding, which the schools received funding for, localities didn't. And then the uh, American Rescue Plan funding is, is going to be uh, financing those programs for them in the summer. And doesn't our budget already have it being doubled from $7,500 to $15,000 for summer school? I thought they already put that in there. Uh, I'm not aware of that fact. I'll have to check on that or uh, hopefully Superintendent Walters can provide some clarity on that. 
And, and certainly we can ask that question of her on uh, Thursday night at six o'clock. Oh, thank you. Uh, right, right now the budget has a, a surplus budgeted of $254,000. There any plans for that or uh, why are we budget is did it just work out that way are we holding those that funds for something in particular some questions or no, nothing in particular uh you know that's that was just what our excess revenues were once we you know finalized the budget and um some of that is one hundred twenty thousand dollars of that is the final utility fund repayment of the loan back to the general fund you know per city pound per city council policy we've not you know, budget of that then to the operating budget that's just you know been reflected as a surplus so uh, there's no particular plan for it at this at this time on page nine where we there's a uh, line item for interest from cemetery fund is that accurate that we're only getting about twenty six thousand dollars from the our investments that's correct right now, looking at the performance of the fund, um, you know, over the past year, it's kind of ebbed and flowed a little bit. And some of that as well is, is from the um, $460,000 that the city holds that's not in the trust fund and is, is LGIP earnings, which are very, very minimal right now. So it's just reflecting overall, um, you know, lower interest and lower investment earnings, um, you know, for the net, for the upcoming year. I'd, I don't want to uh, envision that things are going to improve rapidly because they're they're pretty uh, poor right now as far as interest earnings. What would be the general fund's contribution to maintenance of Evergreen and Oak Grove in in FY twenty two? I mean, I sometimes I have a hard time following along because it comes out of you know public works and so on. Um, so I can move to the page the cemetery budget. And I, and it, I don't believe it's broken down by, you know, any particular uh, cemetery, but. Um, yeah, that's, it's fine. If it doesn't, if it's not broken down, that's fine. But just in the past, it's always been a hundred and some thousand dollars from the general fund that we. Yes, that's uh, we have budgeted for cemeteries, 113,000 for the cemetery budget. Okay. We just need to update the name on that page for next year too. Oh, yes. Good, good catch. And David, keep in mind the uh, investments, um, the income piece is different from the uh, over uh, uh, total return. So where the, the market did well um, over the past year, um, the, the funds being held by SunTrust, it, it may have been would you say 26,000 in income, but there may have been a couple hundred thousand dollars in capital appreciation. Yes, that's, that's correct. The capital appreciation of the fund is performing well, but the dividend and interest income is, is what's not performing well currently. Which is, which is again, why I think over the years we've talked about if that's the best thing for the city right now with, with the amount of fees that SunTrust collects and, you know, cause SunTrust's fees are almost the amount of the $25,000 that we get. Sorry. On page 63, it's the page that's uh, called traffic control device maintenance. Mm -hmm. And it's $120,000 for contractual services. What are you watching? Um, City Council's review of the budget. Oh, I know you say. Mr. Baum, you're uh, not muted. But thank you for joining us. Uh, yes, this $120,000, I believe, and Jeff's here too, if he can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is associated with uh, replacement of a uh, traffic light and control system. Uh, I believe it's the one on hmm. um, East Nelson near Sheets. Is that correct, Jeff? That's correct, David. 
Um, we looked ahead to three or four intersections to do signal improvements because a lot of our equipment is fairly outdated. Um, so we put together some budget projections and we were looking to use our state street funds to look at the sheet signal this particular year. Thank you. It's one thing that I, I don't think I've encountered in my few years on council is, is the maintenance of the traffic signals, but it's definitely something to learn to think about. Wow. But they get knocked over quicker than we can maintain them. So <laughs> that's true. I feel like we should charge Cornerstone since the one right next to Cornerstone gets knocked over the most. We could just say that's Cornerstone's uh, contribution to the city right there. <laughs> How come the lot, the, the city hall parking lot is slated for um, being redone and, and maybe not the, a, a lot that the public uses a little bit more like the McCrum's lot that is pretty challenging at times to, to walk through? Uh, well, Jeff can probably speak to this too. Uh, Jeff had, uh, we worked on a couple different scenarios for what kind of got us, um, you know, the, the most paving for the available funds that we had. And one of those scenarios, which I think covered a lot of bases um, and we needed something within our CIP or some paving job that would fill up the rest of those funds, you know, for the, under a certain amount of funds. And that included the 67,000 for city hall. Um, you know, and we really think it, it gave us the best overall um, paving work for this upcoming year. There's quite a bit programmed in there. Um, Jeff, do you want to weigh in on that at all? Because as I understand it, we had to get a certain amount of paving in in order to get a good return on our bids. And so we were looking at bits and pieces that would make up the appropriate amount we needed so that in FY22, we could, um, again, get the best bang for our buck on that bid. So, sorry, Dennis, I'm afraid oh, no, no worries, no worries. Um, actually, my question, I, and I apologize, Jake, I probably should have asked you this offline um, because it's, it's pretty arcane, but I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of curious about how the courthouse expenses are divvied up between the city and the county. For instance, the electric bill for the courthouse, I know it's about 9,000 a month. I'm, I'm trying to understand how much of that the city pays and how much the county pays. Is, is there any way to kind of figure that out? I mean. Yes, um, so we pay, our, the, the city pays 25% uh, of the courthouse associated expenses. And in, in looking at the actuals for this year, they, they came in um, higher than anticipated. Um, so this is a factor of me, once I get these audited numbers from the county on what their audited expenses were for the year, um, you know, Steve Bolster over at the county sends that to me and I kind of saw the, the cost going up a little bit. So that, that's just a reflection of me seeing the, the numbers from them and, and budgeting accordingly for an increase. Got it. Um, and the reason why I ask, and I, I should mention this to the rest of council, that there had been some interest in doing a solar project on the roof of the courthouse. The roof of the courthouse is a very flat expanse and you could put something up there that would be out of sight. Um, and I, we're trying to figure out like how much that would cost, you know, whether it would make financial sense for the city and county to do um, but I was just, I, I needed to understand our portion of the electrical costs. So, okay. To piggyback on Dennis's question, is the courthouse security also 25%? Because I feel like in years past, the courthouse security has fluctuated um, and it was always something that Noah struggled with and Gary struggled with a little bit, understanding why it would go up and down. And just wondering if this previous, in the current fiscal year, if there has been a decrease in courthouse security since it, the courthouse was closed for, for a portion of the year. Yes, there, there has been a little bit of a decrease this year in courthouse security costs. Uh, I believe they're also budgeted 25%. I'll have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure they are. 
I think the heartburn in the past was primarily just how much they needed uh, and how many people were keeping the uh, courthouse safe. For the equipment replacement, uh, it, it's not in this budget, but when are we planning on replacing the fire truck? Um, that has not yet been determined. I think it came up this year. It's, it's past its 20 year life expectancy. I think it's now, this is its 22nd year, I believe. Um, it was brought up again this year and I know we've had some discussions on it and, you know, how we're, that, you know, if we pay for that hundred percent out of equipment replacement fund balance, that will, um, pretty much wipe that account out. That's expected to be about a $1.4 million purchase. Um, I don't know that we've programmed it for any particular year. I think we were going to explore um, possibly seeking some contributions from within the community for some of the, you know, entities that would benefit, uh, benefit from that type of um, equipment and, and pursue that a little bit further as we kind of figure out how we're going to finance it over the next probably year or two. I would imagine it, it probably needs to be programmed. Thanks. Because you put together an excellent budget, I think, and it, um... You may, because there's no tax increase, it, it, it looks like things are going smoothly and things are going smoothly, but we do have a lot of costs coming up. That's one of them. You know, as you pointed out, we have an 8% increase in our uh, water and sewer costs and we see that continuing to climb. Mm -hmm. um, so the city does need to continue looking for other sources of revenue. But I think what you've put together looks very good. Thank you. Yes, that's very true. I think capital and equipment projects are going to be some of our biggest challenges in the years ahead. And uh, I think there's an email out that um, Jeff Martone is joining uh, a committee or a group to look at the MSA's capital needs uh, and, and having some input. So Jeff, thank you. Unless I'm, is that accurate or did I just make that up? He was asked for information as to the city's uh, projected use of both water and sewer so that the uh, MSA could do an analysis of their future needs. Uh, Jeff, I, get, I know you're online, but that's what I understood. That is correct. Uh, Jordan requested 10, 30, 50 year outlooks uh, on our uh, wholesale water and our wholesale sewage disposal. So I prepared those and sent those this week with uh, one option being if we stay the course as we are now, just looking at future growth. And then the second option being if we fund the improvements that we have shown with our current uh, financial roadmap to better our water and sewer systems, you know, uh, in year 30. So, you know, if we don't do anything, here's what it can climb to. If we do something, here's what it can go down to. I'm sure we'll have a lot of future discussions. I'm sure the projections I gave will marry somewhere in the middle, you know, 30 years, we'll know that. Uh, but to go back to your original question, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, that I think that they have their draft uh, water uh, plant report in, and I believe in another month, they'll be getting the sewer plant report in or study. And uh, Jordan does intend to get with me on um, some of their capital needs on that. Good, because I think it's important for us to, especially as uh, one of two customers, to have some significant impact with our representation. Um, our, our representatives, I think one's an engineer and one is not, uh, and the, the challenges facing the MSA and how they build their roadmap for the future, as opposed to uh, massive uh, either failure or gross expense that's not well thought out. Um, I, I'm thankful for you being a conduit for that uh, as best you can uh, moving forward. Um, Jeff, also, um, it, it may be in here and I'm just not seeing it, but um, the there's a little bit of uh, funding for the courthouse parking deck, um, other charges. And I'm just curious, it, it's, I'm curious about the condition and what we need to do to maintain that. I know we've made some policy changes, if you will, and instead of spread nice, we, we close the uh, exterior parking deck. And, um, but, I, but I think, I know there's some uh, leaking going on and obviously some joints that 
aren't functioning properly or there wouldn't be the, the leaking from floor to floor. Can you comment on that or is there additional funding projected for that? Correct. Uh, there are a few leaking joints. And, you know, basically it's a, a silicone sealer between the prefab uh, box beams that make up the deck. Um, there are a couple localized areas where the sealers failed. I think we can do a lot of that work in house. I don't see much indication of shear connection failure like we funded maybe three, four years ago to the tune of $120,000. Um, this past month, we've been beating on the spall repairs you noted on the, the walls. A lot of those are attributed to uh, for whatever reason, they get split caps on the walls there. So it's a, it's a two piece cap with uh, a joint sealer filler in between. Uh, a lot of that joint sealer is gone, allowed water intrusion into the walls and, and manifested itself in the, uh, the spalls that you witnessed. Um, so we'll probably have to look at uh, resealing those joints as well as the parking deck joints. Hopefully we can do that in-house. Um, if you're curious, uh, commission maybe three years ago, uh, an inspection by Schwartz and Associates, our bridge consultants, um, I'd be glad to copy you on that report. It is three year old, but it's not, it's not all doom and gloom. Right, good, thank you. So is the city, I have a question about the courthouse. Is the city responsible for carrying out those leak, leak repair items or is the county or just how does it work? Uh, I'll, My I'll knowledge, we, we are. Go ahead, Jeff. To my knowledge, we're responsible for the exterior parking deck repairs. The, the city owns the, the parking deck and the county owns the courthouse. What, what's been in question um, is who owns the steps going up the outside. And I've not quite gotten a clear answer on that, but um, that, that's the arrangement for the parking deck and the um, courthouse itself. So the, the repairs that we're hearing Jeff Marton discuss are 100% city owned. Correct. I see, all right. I'd like to uh, further Dennis Ayer's point about the possibilities of the use of solar, installing solar, at least, at least uh, on city owned properties. Uh, back during my orientation session, with the city manager, there was a little discussion about the possibilities of installing solar on uh, on uh, city hall. I asked the question about that, and uh, it's still a question in my mind. Anything that would reduce uh, utility costs, in this case electricity costs, seems like there would be a, a return on investment for that and uh, rather than just have say that there was an old building that it's not really worth doing that, I would differ. I would say it is worth doing it, at least from the point of view of investigating how much it would cost to have solar installed and how much it would save. I mean, actually the school and that part of the project that uh, Mr. Ziegler referred to, they were going to install solar panels to save energy out there. And so my thought is, why can't we do the same thing? I was thinking about uh, uh, WNL has some places uh, where they put solar, but the city doesn't have any. And uh, the city uh, could benefit. I'm thinking uh, here you got Waddell School. Uh, there's a nice roof up there that could have solar electric, uh, Lilburn Downing, possibly City Hall. Uh, we, we have it on Lilburn. Yeah. My mistake, my mistake. Why don't we to, to have it in the future? You don't want to put it on an old roof, though. So you would not want to do it on City Hall, especially if we're going to, we, we need a program to, to renovate or do something with City Hall in five years. So that wouldn't be a good location. But, but like Dennis was saying on the courthouse for Lilburn Downing, we didn't pay anything up front, but we had to um, lock into an electric rate and we, basically it pays for itself over time. I don't know. The programs keep in the incentives from the federal government keep changing. I don't know if that's still an option. Probably the question we could ask uh, Dr. Walters. Yeah, and that was actually probably before her time, but we could uh, talk to the same company, possibly out of Stanton that did Lilburn. Yeah. 
So I wonder what, how many years it takes for a break even. Well, I, I have a, just just so you guys know where this the, the courthouse issue came up. Um, Lee Merrill uh, reached out to me and um, and asked about the courthouse and the possibility of doing solar there. And his idea uh, was to do it over the parking deck. And given our problems with the parking deck, I, just like an old roof, I, I don't know that putting solar there would be appropriate or would get past the architectural review board. But in thinking about it and looking at the blueprints and the aerial view, that roof is just huge and flat. And so, you know, that could be used and it would be out of sight. Um, so I got him the blueprints and the electric bills and he was gonna kind of explore a little bit and figure out some contractors to maybe to talk to. And then I think the idea was to, to get some rough proposals and then bring them back to city council and the board of supervisors to see if there's an interest in partnering on a, on a project to, to do that. And, you know, maybe it's leasing it, maybe it's outright buying it or doing something like was done at, at, at um, Lilburn Downey. Right, well, it, seem, it seems like there is a possibility for something positive happening by installing that solar uh, in there. I mean, you drive around town and you see solar going up in quite a few places. Uh, I noticed Doug and L did an investment in solar. Uh, and so I would, I would think as much well, as we could do, that would be beneficial for us. I, I do think, however, this is largely going to, since 75% of the electric bill is you know, the, the Board of Supervisors has to be on board with this. You know, if there is an upfront cost, I would anticipate we would contribute our 25% to that. Yeah, sure. Um, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful. And it'd be a good way to work with the county on something, you know, something positive that's saving us all money, so. All right, very good. Back in 2016, we estimated that the solar panels on Lilburn Downing would save the city $3,800 per year. That, that that's the save the annual savings to the school district, I should say. So that was about 25% of their, their utility, that, that, that bill. Yeah, because um, that is geothermal as well. So it is yeah. very efficient. Yeah. We can get uh, firmer numbers from the school system, but um, I don't think anyone's a, opposed to solar, but um, making sure it, it's a uh, put in the appropriate time and uh, certainly with the courthouse, it's the county's building. So it's their, their decision whether or not to put it on there. And uh, I believe the, the school, school board has been looking at Waddell uh, since that, uh, I think the, Leslie, am I correct that really the, the roof that was put on was for somewhat intentional to adding solar at some point in time in the future when it was appropriate. That's exactly right, yeah. In, in the plans, Mr. Alligood, but good call. Sooner the better. In looking at the budget though, and Leslie talked a little bit and she said, you know, it's a great budget and, and everything and, and um, no tax increases, but it, is it a fair point to say that the budget though is in theory, not really balanced because it is utilizing six or $700,000 of, of what we anticipate as carryover funds to, to kind of plug the budget. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, no. So, I mean, if you utilize fund balance, you know, it's, you, you still just have to make sure that, you know, that, that overall your revenues from what you're appropriating from fund balance, if you use it and expenditures, um, you know, are balanced, but the, the main balance budget, I believe refers to the governmental fund to the general fund that your, um, you know, revenues at least meet or exceed your expenditures. So the $1.3 million for the capital improvement fund that's carrying that, that to get that 1.3 million, we're using six or $700,000 from previous years. That's correct. So in, in theory, you could say that the capital improvement fund is, is not budgeted at $1.3 million. And we could just do an ordinance or, 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 uh, do a budget amendment or something to move previous year's surplus around in the, in the fund balance. 
Am I, am I right? I mean, it, yeah, th that's correct. It would, around, I mean, that, that use of the $700,000 that's carryover. I mean, it, it's just, it doesn't even need to be in our FY22 budget is, is basically what I'm saying. Correct. Yes. I mean, it, it's, it's available as fund balance from previous year contributions. There's about 2.9 million uh, in fund balance and unassigned fund balance right now in the capital fund itself. So yeah, and you know, it, that's certainly available from previous years to utilize um, within any government budget year. Okay, so, so again, our capital improvement budget for this current year could in theory be $700,000 less. Okay, that, yes. that, that's, and we could just appropriate the previous funds in a different way. And we're just using the FY22 budget to in theory appropriate those funds. That, that's exactly correct, yes. Okay, all right. And in previous years, we actually had a really good table that showed that carryover and how we were gonna to get to our five-year goal. Do you recall? Which maybe I can pull that out and show Jake. It'd be nice to have that updated because that's not, I don't, that's not in the CIP right now, is it? Was that from the retreat? This was from like, it, oh. we had put it together three, four years ago, oh. so how we were going to get to complete our capital program for the next five years, but then we were in trouble after five years. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to look through the files and see if I can find what that might be, uh, some some sort of table you're saying? Yeah, and, and I can, uh, and I, I, you know, I'll find it too, and I can find the old one, but yes, okay. there's a table showing what was carried up, our fund balance and the capital um, fund. <laughs> and how much we're using, adding to it and using the surplus each year to show what uh, we need to transfer over from the general fund. To, ah, to okay. Be able to achieve the, the five year CIP projected, you know, things are five years and beyond um, are wish list things, but it doesn't do us any good to have it on the five year CIP and not have the funding to do it. So it was part and parcel and part of that, as David mentioned earlier, no tax increase is uh, wonderful and perhaps appropriate during a pandemic. However, um, if we're not going to be able to fulfill the, the plans that we have, not the dreams, but the plans for the next five years, that, that can become problematic. I have a question about the, the, the money that was allocated for the I&I &I program. I was wondering if we have begun to see any return, uh, any benefit on that. I know it's a long-term thing. But I was just wondering how that uh, is progressing, uh, the repairing of the I and I problems. Um, as, far, as far as realizing a financial return, we haven't seen that yet. Uh, I know Jeff's Cruz just started some in-house work on that within the last uh, month, a month and a half. Um, I, I mean, he may be able to update, you know, the work and what his crews are, have been able to accomplish thus far, but it, it'll probably take several years to start to see a financial return, um, you know, showing up in our I not reduced I and I expenses. Did they get the new digger? I, I believe so. Yes, it's been, um, I, I believe it's been received. Is that correct, Jeff? Yeah, we've been using the new excavator. It's been wonderful um, to answer to two questions. We did do the work at 203 Ross Road. We placed about 1,000 feet of, uh, there's two sewer mains that go there, six and eight, but 1,000 feet of combined sewer main um, that showed uh, smoke leaking out every, you know, four-foot terracotta joint. We also did about two or 300 feet in Ross Alley. That was our next spot that showed up. Um, but as far as any real investment, that to, to my knowledge, the funds hadn't been appropriate, or they will not until this coming fiscal year, to for the slip lining work, which would be the bulk of the I and I work. Just want to make sure we're on the same page on that. All right. How far off are we on the stormwater revenue um, that would be added to our real estate tax? Is that anywhere in the near future? 
um, so that organizations and businesses would know how to, you know, budget for that in the future. Frankly, I, I, as far, go ahead, sorry. Jim. Frankly, as far as the stormwater fee, what I'd hope to do is put the cigarette tax in place this year, the admissions tax the year after, maybe tackle that stormwater fee the same year as the admissions uh, tax. But that's a real tough one. It takes a big study to even get that in place. Look at all the uh, impervious surfaces, roofs and parking lots in the community. So wasn't going to try and take that on the next year, year and a half at this point. I thought that study had already been done. Yeah, we've done that study already, I believe. We, I thought we had to update yeah, it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. We have done the study. We have updated the GIS where every parcel has all the impervious area documented. I think what Jim is alluding to is that we would have to um, reach a consensus in what format we want to uh, impose a stormwater fee. Uh, there's a couple, there, there's three that EPA highlights. Um, we would have to see how we'd want to go about that. But as far as having the backbone in place, we have it. So you don't think we anticipate that for another couple of years? Again, I did not. Now, if council wants to try and move forward, we've, we've just got a lot on our plates the next year or so. Mrs. Alexander had mentioned uh, adding to the real estate tax. Uh, I'm familiar with what Stanton did. They put it on their utility bill. Correct. It's typically a utility as opposed to a tax. It's a fee. And it was a separate line item on their utility bill. So you have water, sewer, and then stormwater fee. So you have three numbers added up on the Stanton utility bills. I believe some of the discussions in the past had uh, involved setting up a new enterprise fund for stormwater, if I'm remembering correctly. And that would entail a little bit of accounting work, setting up a new fund and, and you know, all that that would entail. But uh, I think that was the general idea. Some of our discussions leaned more toward the real estate tax rather than utility bill. We talked about all of it though. On page Roman numeral two, um, and then also later in the budget, I guess, but there's a reference to a special account that has been added to partially fund Jordan's Point Park improvements on an annual basis. Am I though correct that that, that, that special account has no any money in it in the current FY22 budget or how much is in there for FY22? Um, that, so, you know, we, we, we discussed making some sort of a, a move on um, Jordan's Point capital improvements. We don't have a actual project identified yet out of the, the list of projects that we would like to take on. But um, I think, you know, Jim and, our, just Jim and I in our discussions for planning the budget, we wanted to see some sort of funding at least set aside for that. And I did put it into the park maintenance budget uh, on a capital outlay line. Again, not in the CIP since we don't have a concrete project identified, but uh, just shy of $54,000 we put aside to um, begin building up funds for Jordan's Point projects in this fiscal year. Thank you. I was I was unsure where that how much it was because it I was it wasn't then labeled specifically Jordan's Point Park later in the in the budget. So I was just confused on that. So thank you very much. Sure. I would like to move to. Uh, a different topic I had mentioned, but still budget related. <clears throat> I had mentioned in an email I sent around earlier about uh, the use of body cams in the Lexington Police Department that uh, aren't being used now. My understanding they have car cams, and I read Mr. Ayer's uh, comments on it as well. And uh, I was given some thought with all the discussion uh, that's been uh, in the news uh, nationwide, but in particular, uh, not only about the Minneapolis situation, but about the Windsor, Virginia situation. And one of the points that uh, Mr. Ayers had made uh, that came from the police department, he was reporting 
that there are good car cams in the police cars now that, that work well and that there is an audio connection to the microphone that's a wireless and whatnot. And I was thinking about the Windsor thing. I watched the, the uh, body cam from one of the police officers in Windsor. And I was saying, well, what if that video hadn't been available? Well, if it hadn't been available, you wouldn't have seen the army lieutenant with his hand stuck out the window because that wouldn't show up on audio. And you wouldn't see the pepper spray and in his face because that wouldn't have showed up on audio and whatnot. So I want to make the case that uh, it would be a good thing uh, for Lexington to have and, and step into, I guess, the 20th century with this technology. I know we're there a little bit. We've got our toe maybe up to the ankle. I'd like to see more of the legs stuck in and have uh, our police be equipped with body cams. I think it would be a, a really great thing for Lexington. And I think it would, it cuts both ways, of course. It is good for the police as well as good for the citizens. It's just more eyes uh, on a particular subject. And I don't have a cost estimate for it. I saw Mr. Ayer's projection. I don't know, we can look closer into it. I was wondering uh, if there was some way we could add that to our budget for the police department. Well, that'd be up to city council, of course, you have that opportunity. You know, the, 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 the department itself did not um, indicate that was a need under the current circumstances. Um, you know, trust in the community is very high. The department has a great reputation. Understand your point about it, you know, if it cuts both ways. Sometimes you can see in the body cam that um, claims made against the police department may not be true. And you can also see in the body cam that sometimes an officer may or may not have done something that should have been or should not have been done. But anyway, the police department did not ask for it, so we did not put it in the budget. We're still in a very limited budget situation because of because of COVID, um, just trying to build back in the things that we didn't have in this current year. I wonder how some of my fellow council members would feel about that, about adding body cams to the police. I think it would be helpful to have an educated idea of what it would cost, because I think in the next few weeks and months, we'll be requested to fund a skate park, improvements at Kids Place, uh, the nonprofits that are not currently in the budget. There's, there's significant things that are not getting resourced in this budget and in future budgets for that matter. Um, you know, the, the schools have at times wanted a, a school resource officer. Um, there, there's lots of things that are wants and the challenge is we can actually fund every single thing. We can just raise taxes, but every single thing can be funded. Um, but I think we just need to understand truly with Dennis's good input on kind of giving me an education on, on how things work. What would this cost the taxpayers of the city, not just for the hardware, because that could be a one-time cost, but then who within the police department is in charge of cataloging the video? How much is the, you know, the, the cloud storage? All of these things can be overcome. And then what is the fee that we pay to the Commonwealth's attorney so that they're well staffed to deal with the video? Um, I just don't have an educated idea. If, if someone came back and said it's gonna be $15,000 a year, wow. But if someone says it's $100,000 a year, I, gotta, I, I have to start to think about the, the finite resources that we have. So that's kind of my thoughts on it. No, I, I agree I, that I, we need to take a look at what the real costs are uh, for it, not just the equipment cost itself, but it's an idea that certainly is gaining, uh, the body cam idea is gaining a lot of traction uh, in our whole country today because of certain situations. And I just view it as a, a step in modernizing our police department, which I wanna say I hold in the highest regard, no doubt about it in there. And so it's, uh, I wanted, I want us to discuss it and come to a consensus on it uh, as well. I appreciate that the police didn't put it in the budget. Uh, the police department didn't, 
uh, it's my understanding that Chief Roman was in favor of it, but it, uh, you know, he's not here now. Maybe the new chief will be in favor of it and whatnot, get the conversation started. So I wanted to put it on the table so that uh, we could begin the conversation. When, when Chief Roman was here, it came up at Community Watch and the Commonwealth's attorney was there and he said everything Dennis said, that you're looking at hiring another person, at least one person in the Commonwealth's attorney's office to, to review everything. And it has a lot of expense and it makes no sense for Lexington to do it without the county doing it as well. And so for, for my opinion, I'm not ready to ask staff to spend any time on this. Uh, when the new police chief starts and she feels differently and works with the Commonwealth's attorney's office and they can give us a different proposal, uh, I would consider it at that, that time, but I don't wanna spend any staff time at this time looking at trying to put it in this budget. I think I'd like to hear from the experts, you know, from the police themselves, um, especially from the new police chief who has probably used body cam as well as not used one um, to determine, you know, what, you know, those expert opinions are as she works with the Commonwealth attorney, as well as with the county sheriff. Um, I think among those groups, you know, they can come back to us and let us know what their thoughts are and then go from there. Um, the other piece of that to think about is you don't need it until you have a situation that happens and wish you had it. Um, so I think it is worthy of discussion and I think it's, it's worthy of our new police chief to put it on her agenda to do some inquiries and, and come back to us with her um, with her thoughts. Um, as I said in my email, um, with that background information, since I work for the Commonwealth attorney, I, this is not something that I can weigh in on either way. So I. Thank you, Dennis. I'd, I'd uh, support Marilyn's statement. I'm relying more upon the guidance of the people that will be using them or, or feel they need or not need to have them um, after our new chief gets uh, her feed wet and, and gets a read on, on our community. Um, and I would imagine maybe after six to 12 months in the job, she'll have a much better idea of the necessity of, of that equipment. And, and I, I'll be quite upfront. I don't know of any issues at all uh, that, uh, where this would have made a difference. It's, it's just that uh, I agree with Ms. Alexander's statement, when you need it, you need it. And then if you needed it and didn't have it, it's too late. So I, I would support uh, waiting for the new chief and getting some feedback uh, from her. Thank you, Mr. Alligood. Appreciate you raising that issue. Other budget questions council has? I have one, uh, one more, one more. It's, it's a small thing uh, it's, and it's just having to do with the discretionary agencies and the allocations and the requests that were made uh, and the recommendations that were made uh, back on page 59, not, not of the, the books, but uh, in a previous submittal, I think from two meetings ago, uh, and in particular, uh, the pool for the city pool uh, has shown on it the Rockbridge area housing. Let's see, let me, let me get this. I'm on the wrong line. For swimming, F O R swimming, uh, had uh, a fifteen thousand dollar request, but it's in discretionary. I thought this is just a question for clarification. I thought that there was an agreement between the city and the county that they would do matching things. And it's kind of an agreement thing, like it's a letter. And uh, I was wondering that it wouldn't that take it out of the discretionary part and couldn't it be better placed in the non-discretionary part since it's tied to expenditures from the county? for swimming. 
So to, to my knowledge, uh, there may be some sort of um, written MOU or something to that effect. I've not seen it. There's nothing in the actual four uh, swimming pool agreement between the city and four swimming uh, for any mandatory cost share, no contractual cost share there. But however, the, the city does still own the, the structure and all of the appurtenances of the pool, you know, other than, you know, um, movable equipment and the dome and things like that, that four swimming owns. But the city, the city still owns that structure and four swimming provides um, the service of running that pool on behalf of, of the city. Um, you know, the city still insures that pool and, and everything and the like. So um, I believe in last year's discussions that this came up as, as a reason that uh, I guess technically that it's, it's a discretionary expense, but because of the, the public nonprofit relationship there of them operating city property for the city that um, they will be, continue to be funded. And additionally, um, with them now operating the outdoor pool as well, um, that, that was my recollection of why the funding requests um, remained in the budget. So could we move the item to the non-discretionary call? Uh, we could, uh, you know, it's, it, it, again, to my knowledge, there's no mandatory um, contribution that the city has to make, but there are some contractual relations between Four Swimming and, and the city that um, make it a little bit more special case, I guess. Mr. Allegood, how about we look into that and see if there is a, an agreement uh, that would lead us to uh, want to put that into the non-discretionary non area? Very good. Yeah, I hear your point. Good idea. We'll take a look at it. Doesn't change the dollars. It's just a little more accurate. That's right. It just moves columns mm -hmm. or lines. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't have any more questions. Mr. Allegood. Any others? I'm curious about if uh, council members um, uh, identified the uh, CIP item on page um, 23-5, the GF77, which would be the city hall renovations and improvements, 3.3 um, million in 24-25. I wasn't quite sure where the funding was coming for that. So this uh, this this CIP uh, the project, I believe, has been on the CIP for several years, and they've even been um, you know pushed down several years, I believe, pushed down the road a little bit. Um, you know, we are going to go ahead and still program it. I, I know it's a need that we've all discussed, and. Um, we do in the FY23 have some initial design work programmed for that to begin a space needs assessment or you know, anything it may take to figure out how we're going to um, you know, incorporate any type, tor any type of renovation to City Hall and what that may look like. So, um, you know, there's no financing mechanism in place as of yet, whether we would finance that, whether we would pay for that through um, fund balance or, or any other revenue source, but I know it's a project that's been on the books for a while and, um, you know, we're, we're planning to take it on and begin at least the, the initial steps of, um, you know, studying what we need to do in order to, to make the renovations. That's a good point, Frank. I mean, I think when, if you look in the, on the, and we talked about this briefly in our retreat on the debt service schedule on page 127, uh, uh, 26 or between 26, uh, sorry, 2026 and 2027, we have a drop in our debt service. And that is, we should really start being strategic about planning that renovation. And I think that would be, fit in well with it doing it in that time frame when we retire some debt. And in addition to the, the two school bonds that will, will come off in 26 and 27, 
um, kind of had, have been looking out in horizon for a potential refinancing opportunity on the school bonds that would be callable in 2000 or FY24, I believe. Um, so that may be another uh, event on the horizon that would present some savings. You know, it's, it's hard to say what, um, you know, coupon rates on bonds will be several years down the road, but you know, considering uh, we would pursue in all likelihood a tax exempt refinancing, um, there could be significant savings, um, you know, at that point. So just another debt service saving potential down the road to, to look at as well. And to Leslie's point, I've, I've just been assuming that the high school was going to require millions and millions of dollars to bring that up to be to where it should be in the region and our jail also requiring millions of dollars. So I've, I've been concerned about looking forward to 26, 27 when that debt service does fall away. But I know we've got those two projects that are looming of which we don't really get to vote on whether they're done or not. I mean, we've got a seat on the jail commission, of course, but I mean, those projects we know need to be done and, and, and we don't get to uh, pick and choose probably. So just, and of course, you know, the high school, I was wrapping my mind around the funds for the auxiliary gym and these other projects and, and saying, okay, we owe about a million dollars for athletic facilities in the next four or five years. And then that's what took me aback a couple of weeks ago when we slid in there the extra $730,000 for the Floyd SK Votex Center. So in my mind, the million dollars that I was expecting in the next few years for the high school went to $1.7 million uh, for the high school in the next few years, just, just like that. So um, definitely things are on the horizon. We need more revenue. We need more people in the city and more water customers because lots of things are coming down the road. So we got the cigarette tax. Just kidding. I have uh, a comment, and maybe maybe it's a question. Years ago, Lexington allocated lodging taxes to the horse center, and there was an item, uh, and it was tied. And, and as I recall, city council voted to cap the amount that went to the horse center. And I was just wondering how that's playing out uh, with the reduced lodging taxes uh, that are coming in during this pandemic and where we are on uh, that particular expenditure that goes to the horse center from Lexington Lodging. So the cap uh, you're referring to is for the additional 1% collection. I yeah. believe it's capped at 61,000 maximum from that 1%. Um, you know, this year for with with COVID and what lodging tax has been, how it's been reduced, there's, you know, really no, um, no possibility of exceeding that uh, at this point in this year. But, um, you know, it, it is a hard cap. So we monitor the collections each year. And, you know, once it um, hits that $61,000 cap, that no more from that additional 1% can be contributed. Was, was there a term specified for that particular uh, additional amount for the lodging tax since it was dedicated directly uh, to go to the horse center? Yes, there was, it was a term that that contribution was limited to a term. I, I can't recall right off the top of my head. I, I believe it's um, probably expiring within the next several years, but I, I don't recall the exact date. So once it expires, uh, would it be reasonable to say that that would uh, uh, be new revenue to the city? Yes, potentially. I mean, as long as, uh, you know, council at the time does not want to um, extend that agreement, uh, that could be additional revenue dollars that would come back to the city, of course. With, with, yeah, I'm talking about uh, ending the agreement that the money flows to the horse center, but the uh, tax would still stay in place and come to the city Instead, the revenue would. Yeah, potentially. I, I believe there was some enabling legislation that allowed for the additional one percent. So it may not, you know, be as easy as just, you know, ceasing collection and, and um, pass through to the horse center and collecting it as general revenue. There'd probably be some additional um, work that would have to be done there. But uh, yeah, I, I think that was a special case for that additional one percent. It wasn't just allowed for general uh, revenues. Right. I'm 
just trying to count pennies here. Great idea, Mr. Alligo, but um, I was going to raise, or I want to echo the position that Jake uh, tenderly talked around. Um, that directive came from the General Assembly and enabled us to charge the extra penny on the bed tax for the purpose of helping the um, horse center when the, the state, uh, in my, my words, abandoned the horse center. And I, I have grave concerns that they would continue that legislation to continue on for us to be able to charge that and use it for our purposes. Hope they will, but I wouldn't count on it. Well, the horse center is viable now, isn't it? Um, I, I direct you to city staff on the opinion on their uh, financials. Um, I do know from looking at their financials and you know hearing some things coming from them that this past season was one of the best they've had in many years. Um, so things that reports have been very positive from the horse center, even in um, trying times with COVID, they've had a uh, great turnout to their events. So cross the fingers. That request from the horse center was for the five-year extension that went through FY24. So um, just, you know, a couple more, a few more years of that. Um, the, uh, I, actually, there was a part of this that was kind of new to me. So, so that extra one percent that, that that we're paying until twenty twenty five to the horse center. What you're saying is, if we didn't give that that one percent, then we probably wouldn't be able to keep it in our general fund. If that is the case, then I, I, if that is the case, then I would expect we would probably continue that arrangement to assist the horse center because it's not it's not really affecting our revenues. I think it's even more complicated than that because um, counties are limited on how much transient occupancy tax they can collect, whereas cities have more flexibility. So I think that we have to look at it. But I think part of the reason we needed legislation was to allow the county to collect that. I extra. see. Oh, but we, I think you're right. There is a difference between city and county. So we could, hold on to it, but the county couldn't. Okay. Possibly. And, you know, whenever we talk about raising meals tax or transit occupancy tax, yeah, the businesses will go, they will not be yeah. happy. Yeah. What other questions do council have? I'm inclined to call us adjourned before anybody asks a question. Just kidding. Uh, we, we do plan, to, obviously, to have other work sessions. So as you uh, absorb more of the information and um, get a better understanding of the operations and the coming year ahead budget and then the CIP for the plan next five years, um, we'll, we'll have the opportunity for more questions. But for this evening, any more questions? Well, Mr. Mayor, I, I would note that we'd scheduled another work session, as you indicated. Of course, we had scheduled it on the 22nd, which is a night we have planning commission. So being virtual, we can't uh, share that evening with them. Um, so we'll probably have to send out a poll again to figure out when is another good date for us to have that second work session. Very good. Unless we want it to be in person and then we could uh, do it at any time. And that might be a good way to finish up our work sessions for the budget this year. I mean, up to city council, of course. Then we would not be able to have Leslie join us. Why not? She's in planning commission. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, you meant that day. I have it that day. I thought you meant Charlie. But right now we have our next budget session is... Yeah, that's is on Thursday at six o'clock. Yeah. Our work session with school board is. Uh, our, our next work session is a joint meeting with the school board on Thursday at six o'clock and regular meeting at seven. We technically have, we can um, discuss the budget and have questions during the regular meeting would be my expectation. 
But on the 22nd, whether it's virtual or in person, there would be a conflict for Leslie. Mm -hmm. what, what time does planning meet? 530? 5 to 7. So if we did it after 7. If folks wanted to. Any um, desire to victimize Leslie on the 22nd? <laughs> Well, uh, think about it. Uh, Janie may send out. Um, the council members want to opine on the idea of our next meeting being in person as the city manager requested. Um, can I ask, uh, Charles, are you are you fully vaccinated? Where, where are you? I am in limbo. I haven't been fully vaccinated and uh, plan on getting my second one this coming Friday. And uh, so I would still prefer virtual for this short term plan. Well, it seems like it seems like if, if, if it's this coming Friday for you, then our next regular city council meeting on May 6th, I mean, maybe maybe we should sort of aim for that. Would, would that be a possibility? I think the time would work, or is it just a two-week uh, delay after you get vaccinated? Uh, Ten days, I believe, is the is the required. All right, so I'll be there. So, so we, is is May sixth the the night we are anticipating adopting the budget? That's correct. With limited in, uh, input, we could potentially do that if you had a work session that evening, but. Uh, Jake, could we re, uh, could we uh, put that off that adoption to the uh, the twentieth of May? Um, I think we could. I think we ran into an issue last year with the timing of adopting the school budget and then the, the state code. I have to do some research and make sure that we would be okay on the twentieth. I think we would. I don't think we'd be in any danger uh, at that point. And, and I apologize, my meeting was that, that, that our first meeting together in person would be our regular city council meeting on the 6th, not, not, to, not to delay the work session on the budget to, to that. Um, apologies. Um, but if we, have the, if we have it before then, I think we probably would have to do it by Zoom. Yeah. Do we need another budget work session? I mean, I have a couple questions for the schools, but assuming we'll get those answered Thursday. I, 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 would, I would suggest that Thursday we decide if we wanna have another work session um, uh, per Mr. Alligood's request, unless there's an objection, we will plan for it to be virtual and be um, perhaps the 22nd or sometime the week of the 26th. Um, still with the plan for adoption on the 6th. And uh, Dennis's request that, um, unless there's an objection, that we meet in person on the 6th of May or, or work towards that. Does anybody have an objection to that? We'll, we'll certainly, uh, you know, the current requirements from the governor and the emergency order are masked and uh, social distance. So that would be part of the part and parcel for the, the meeting in person to uh, embrace those um, circumstances. That sounds like a good plan. I'll just throw out, there's a fifth Thursday in April. So the 29th is unscheduled. Right. Unless you scheduled to do something because you didn't have counsel. Just kidding. <laughs> in, any concerns or objections to those ideas? Are we still anticipating meeting in person at uh, Waddell or has that location been changed? Jim, I'll let you respond to that. I know we've, we've talked about um, the uh, county meeting room. We've talked about um, uh, Liburn Downing uh, as easier access than, than Waddell, but uh, I don't know that a firm decision has been made from that standpoint. We were waiting to get an estimate on the uh, audio equipment that's necessary so that we could have both the council speaking, of course, and then the um, public was up at the speaker's platform speak. And last I heard from Nathan, we've not gotten that information back from the vendors. 
So it may be a little bit difficult. Uh, of course, we could have it in meeting uh, in person and we wouldn't have to have the sound equipment. I, I think Janie then suffers though, of course, because doing minutes is very difficult. So we might have to go to Waddell for that purpose. The equipment in light of all the, the hoops, we, it sounds like we need to jump through to get back to in-person meeting. Um, what's the downside of not meeting in person? If, if it sounds like possibly the, the, the difficulties are gonna outweigh the, the benefits of, of meeting in person. I don't think there are any hoops to, to jump through. Uh, if, if we continue to meet at Waddell, there was a desire to, to move to uh, Liburn Downing. If it you know, technology wise doesn't work, we just continue at Waddell. I mean, that, that it's set up and, and ready to go from that standpoint. But we can certainly, uh, we're um, uh, un under the emergency order and can continue in Zoom as well. Got, got options. So we can't move the sound equipment from Waddell to Lilburn? It was not recommended that we could. I can't tell you why right off the top of my head, but I know Nathan and Janie were discussing that along with Arnie and that didn't seem to be um, something that would readily work or at least not preferred. Maybe the age of the equipment or the technology. If it worked in... Um, Hey, Jim, let me just suggest uh, perhaps you could have Nathan join us for a brief presentation on Thursday to let us know why that doesn't work because the equipment's not that old. Um, but uh, I thought we used the ceiling mounted speaker that's that's that yeah. could be impacted. They have, they have the same thing at the, I believe, in the Lilburn cafeteria. I'll check and I'll let you know. Yeah, and my perception, I think at one point, Nathan was looking at the gym, but the cafeteria would be preferable as well. So um, we, we still have the dilemma of the, the setup of the tables and chairs and um, all of that good stuff, which was the, that's been the joy of uh, Zoom, just clicking off and going, going about your business. You don't even have to worry about staggering home in the dark. I would like to put my vote in for Lilburn Down, and I think it'd be a very convenient place uh, for anyone. But much easier to get into than the steps and um, elevator at, at Waddell, to be sure. Yeah. And it won't be as dark when you leave. <laughs> what are you saying? It's, it doesn't get dark at Lilburn Downing? No, it doesn't get dark. Daylight all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Anything else uh, to come before the uh, group this evening relative to budget, which is our reason for meeting? Hearing no questions, we'll reconvene for work session at six o'clock on Thursday, joint with the school board. Um, uh, we'll plan to add a presentation from Nathan on Thursday, assuming he uh, can put things together. And then we will um, uh, carry on and perhaps at our next meeting, um, schedule a subsequent work session, depending upon additional questions. Um, there's nothing else to come before us this evening. I uh, hope you all have a great evening and we'll see you Thursday. We stand adjourned. Thank you, Jim.